Duckbox. Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! The votes are in, and today's doll base is... Legless Claudine. And before you ask, no, I don't know where her legs have gone. I can't recall if I cut them off, or if I just received her this way. At any rate, I'll have to think of something to do with the poor thing. There's actually a lot of potential here. We could go the mermaid route. But you know what? I got this rush of inspiration after watching KP Creations video showing how she made a unicorn art doll. If you're interested in or involved in the custom doll community in some way, which I assume you are, no doubt you've run across something like this before. They're called art dolls and are generally half-sculpted, half-stuffed, posable creatures. Artists who create them tend to enjoy exploring fantasy themes, which leads to these epic and ethereal works of art. Built from the ground up, these dolls are some of the most unique in the world and can be as diverse as the artists that make them. Cool, right? I've wanted to try my hand at this for ages, but never had the time. Well, today's the day, friends! Old legless Claudine here is practically asking for an art doll style centaur body. With my vision set, let's get to work! Let's start by separating the parts further because she isn't broken enough already. Heat the head up and wrench it off the neck. Swirl a chopstick around inside to loosen the remaining hair plugs, then tug those out with needle nose pliers. All cleaned out! I chop off her wolf ears, drill new holes into her temples, then insert two short wire pegs. I thought I would finally give friendly form a try. Doll Motion kindly sent me this sample a couple years ago, but I've been too scared to use it. You pour the pellets into boiling hot water, wait for them to turn clear and sticky, then scoop them out and quickly sculpt the mass. It hardens too quickly for fine detail sculpting, but it's great for quick simple shapes like these fawn ears. It turned from clear gelatin to hard plastic in about two minutes. Very cool. Trace around the base of the ears for reference, then remove them for now. Let's work on hair. Seth and Diana from the Doll Planet sent me some of their new hair stock, which I've been dying to try out. We've got dark brown and blonde brown. Claudine looks great with both of them, but I decided on dark brown. The blonde felt more cheetah-like. Now, the usual way I root doll hair is by taking a plug, folding it in half, and stabbing it into the head. But this hair comes pre-braided, so it looks kind of funny done this way. If we're imagining these as box braids, you wouldn't have two braids coming out of one spot, right? So I cut the hair in half, and slip it over the needle eye just at the very edge of the plug. Insert that, and the short end disappears into the head, leaving you with a single braid coming out. That looks much better. I plug all the way around the hairline, and also along both sides of the part. Why does Soko always join me for the reroute? For the rest of her head, I want to fill it in with yarn of a similar color. And of course! To all my fellow crafters, let me know if you have this problem too. I have every color of yarn in the world, except the one I need for my current project. Ah, I had to run to the store. Where was I? I cut the yarn the same length and untwist the fiber to make it thinner and wavier. See how it's a slightly different texture and size to the nylon? I think that variety is going to make the hair look really cool. Using the same single strand approach, I fill in the rest of the head. A massive crack along her part formed while I was working, yikes. Sadly, a common problem. But we can fix this! Take a needle and thread and simply sew the skull shut again. Well, easier said than done, I guess. Use a pair of pliers to pull the needle through if you have to. Not bad! 
Now just carefully avoid cutting your stitches as you fill in the remaining plugs. You can see I actually rooted two lines down her part this time. This is also to help sell the illusion of a box braid hairstyle. I want to be able to see the skin along the part this time. Remember the gaping holes in the head from cutting off the wolf ears? I wonder if more friendly form would do the trick for filling those. Worth a shot! I stuck one plug in there while it was still soft and gooey. Uh, it's not a perfect solution, but it worked! Seal the deal by pouring galaxy glue into the head and squishing it around to thoroughly coat the tips inside. Because of the nature of this reroute, I'm really counting on the glue this time. <laughs> Once it's dry, reunite the head and body. Let's move right along to the face. Mask off the hair using a scrap piece of fabric and pins along the hairline. Before we start, I cleanse the face with soap and warm water to remove any dirt and oil that might be on there. Head outside with your can of Mr. Super Clear and respiratory mask to spray the doll. I like to do several short bursts at different angles to make sure it coats all surfaces of the face. I begin with a dusting of pastel for eyeshadow and lip color. I'm sticking with a natural earth tone palette for this one. Lots of rich browns and rusty reds. Then I start sketching the eyes on in a forest green pencil. Not sure why I use green to be honest. I'm ignoring Claudine's mold and pushing the eyes further outside her face to give her wide set eyes like a deer. Sketch on the eyebrows. Did pretty good this time. And fill in the iris. She's getting large black doe eyes, again to mimic a fawn. The placement looks good, so I head back in with blacks and browns to darken the sketch and add shading around the eyelid crease. Once the color stops building, take a break and spray the doll with a fresh layer of sealant. You never know what you're going to get with Stockbox. We go in blind and hope for the best, but sometimes you get lucky. That was the case with this project. I had a vision for this doll in my mind's eye, and the pieces just fell into place. Sometimes you enter that flow state and have a great art day, you know? Those are the best kinds of projects. Finish things up with cute freckles dotted along her face with gouache paints and a couple of big googly eye shines. Give her the final layer of sealant, and once that's dry, we can gloss her lips and eyes with varnish. This step really brings life into a face up. I usually skip the eyes just because it's harder to photograph a doll with shiny eyes, but this time I felt it was necessary for a sweet doe character. Unwrap the doll burrito and bam, hair and face done. That means it's time to tackle the biggest part, the centaur body. Step one is armature. I need to create a wire skeleton that's firmly connected to our doll. I cut two long lengths of wire and thread them through the hole that's already in the pelvis area, where the legs used to connect, I assume. Then twist. And we're going to have to pull the camera back because wire is flying everywhere and I don't want to scratch the lens. That's better. After twisting the four lengths together at the base, two of them branch out to be the front legs, and the other two twist together to form the spine and eventually the hind legs. It's hard to visualize at this stage, but I took my best guess as to how long the back and limbs should be and bent them accordingly. One wire looked far too flimsy to me, so I actually ended up doubling the amount of wires, so that each leg could have two armatures instead. I wrapped the new set to the original one with jewelry wire. 
I made the legs intentionally long so that we can cut them down to the right size at the same time, making sure they're even. You can see the pelvis area split open and the wire fell off, so I need to reattach the body. Better this time. I decided to drill a couple holes through the middle and on each butt cheek so I could essentially sew her into the armature with more wire. That's nice and strong. I won't have to worry about her popping out after this. And there we go. Nailed it. Best doll yet, I'd say. Like and subscribe. I'll catch you next time. <laughs> Just kidding. She's got a long way to go. This friendly form is great, so let's use it once again to secure the armature around her pelvis and build up some form. Aw, oh, I used it all. Maybe I was too liberal with this stuff. At any rate, I want to switch to epoxy sculpt to add more weight to her centaur body. The friendly form dries hard and light like plastic, while epoxy sculpt has more weight to it. Because of the doll body and all that hair, there's a lot of weight over the front legs. So some junk in her trunk should help move her center of gravity backwards and stabilize the doll. I also used epoxy to sculpt her hooves, which I carved and sanded sharp after the epoxy fully cured. Now's a good time to bring up KP Creations again. Although slightly modified to work with a doll, all the techniques I'm using came from watching her videos. Thanks, Karen! So make sure to go show her channel some love after this. I don't have the puffy cotton strips Karen uses for her dolls, but I do have lots of leftover fabric scraps. Hey, I'm all for upcycling, so let's give it a shot. Taking my strips of fabric, I wrap them around the armature wire, occasionally making a knot to daisy chain them together. Not a very elegant solution, but I tried to hide the chunky knots on her underbelly where I want to build up some thickness anyway. To make the fabric lay correctly, I did bust out the needle and thread on occasion, but I only did that a couple times around tricky curves, like the haunches. One thing to keep in mind is the thickness of this meaty underlayer. Faux fur bulks up any form by several degrees, so factor that in as you wrap the legs. They may look too skinny now, but they'll end up being just the right thickness by the end. The fabric wants to slide up the legs, so I use a touch of glue to set it in place on top of the hooves. Alright, hopefully that's good. Next phase. I'll be using white and dark brown faux fur fabrics. The entire process of sewing on the fabric felt like a very slapdash procedure, but I'll do my best to explain. I eyeballed patches of fabric, pinning the fabric to the doll on occasion to gauge how big a chunk to cut. I also used pins as markers to cut slits for the legs to go through. Then it's just a matter of sewing the pieces together. Easier said than done, I'm afraid. The fibers are so long, even after cutting them back, they get in the way. I promise this isn't a bad camera angle, I can't see what I'm doing either. <laughs> Here's how I attach the legs. I cut a tapered trapezoid the length of the leg and wrap it around. I stitch it to the armhole first, then work down the inseam. As I was sewing, I tried only to attach fur to fur and avoid stitching into the base. I'm not sure if this was the right approach. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to sew into the base, but for some reason I got it into my head that I was forming the casing around the plush body and that the two shouldn't be connected. Maybe it'll help with posability? Let's finish with some transitional fur, which I glue piece by piece to the body. This covers up the blunt end of the fabric and feathers the texture into the plastic body to look more natural. Done. She looks like a fluffy sheep. Let's shear her. I keep a comb handy to straighten out the tangles and take it nice and slow, snipping away the longest parts, then hesitantly clipping the fur shorter and shorter until it's just right. The most difficult areas were under the belly and underarms. You can't get a good angle there. Whew, that took hours. And there is fur all over this studio. My allergies are going nuts. <laughs>
It's not perfect. You can see I got too close to the skin by the hooves. And the sewing along the body is kind of lumpy, but hey, I'm happy with this. Oh yeah, almost forgot her tail. I'll just stitch that on. Time for the scariest part. Not scary because it's hard to do, but scary because I hate using the airbrush. Check this out. We're going to paint on a color gradient, turning this ho-hum fur into a beautiful, realistic coat. It's like magic, especially when the footage is sped up like this. My husband was with me for this part, and whenever the airbrush clogged or quit working, he just touches it and it comes back to life. I don't know what he's doing differently from me, but the airbrush just likes him, I think. <laughs> Go, Bambi. What's painted fur feel like, you ask? Well, the lighter colors feel basically the same, but the fur has hardened slightly around the darkest areas where I really layered on the paint. That's to be expected, but it's well worth the trade-off for the beautiful gradient effect. I take her back inside and paint on the off-white fawn spots and also paint her hooves and the ears. Bet you forgot about those. Both the ears and hooves receive two coats of varnish so the paint won't chip off and I glue tufts of white fur inside the ears. So fluffy. Find the blank space on the skull that we marked earlier, add a touch of glue, and shove them back in the head. That's the majority of the doll done, you guys! I'm already very pleased with this project. But let's have some more fun with the accessories and finishing touches, shall we? Let's do something with all this hair. I relocate her part. And tie off two high ponytails. Twist the hair until it naturally bends around to form a bun. Tie the bun down with embroidery thread, and voila! Adorable space buns! It wasn't intentional, but the buns sort of make up for, or rather take the place of antlers. <laughs> Next, let's get fancy with more braiding and adding trinkets. I love me some fancy hair trinkets! To get some ideas, I simply googled cool box braid hairstyles and felt endlessly inspired by what I saw. Next, I made a simple tube top out of green crushed velvet. It looks sort of mossy, which fits the nature theme. I hem the edges, add an embroidery thread strap in the middle, then tie it around her neck and lace up the back. She's so close to done, but I feel like she needs something around the fawn part of her body. That's right, I'm working overtime for this one. I made a simple bag pattern real quick out of paper, cut it out of faux leather, and stitch it together from the outside. I thought if the stitches show, it'll have that homemade feeling, like maybe this character crafted these herself in the forest. For that reason, I used a different color leather and different stitch pattern on her second bag. I made a small blanket to go over her back, and lay down the bags, which I've sewn to a strap. Snug it up, just like putting a saddle on a horse, and she's finished at last! She needs a good name that's equal parts beautiful and whimsical. What do you think about Tamara Tinyhoof?
I could not be happier with this doll. I love how she turned out, and perhaps most importantly, I really enjoyed every part of the process. This doll came together so quickly, and I had so much fun! I hope you like Tamara as much as I do, and let me know if you're tempted to make an art doll now. I've left links to all the artists I've mentioned in the description box below for your reference. Also, don't forget to vote for the next Stockbox doll in the poll below, and thank you so much for tuning in! See you next time! Stay artsy! Annyeong! Come on, come on, come on.